Hello and welcome to this two-part teaching on nerves of the upper limb. Today we shall be looking at the brachial plexus. The objectives of this teaching are to learn how to describe the course of the brachial plexus as it travels down the upper arm, to learn its branches and their functions, and we'll also talk about brachial plexus injuries. So I am sure you have all been presented with a picture of the brachial plexus once before and it is reasonable to not understand it or get confused at first glance however just as we've been all taught to practice medicine this can easily be simplified using a structured approach and initially we'll do this by breaking it down as a 2d model so the brachial plexus is essentially a map and any map needs a starting point and for the brachial plexus this begins from the roots in the neck the next part as it transitions down the upper limb are known as the trunks. Then after that come the divisions, followed by the cords, and finally it finishes as its terminal branches. And now we can already start to see the brachial plexus take its shape. And using this logical sequence, you will hopefully never get lost. But it's not as simple as that. And unfortunately for this exam, whether you sit in part A or part B, you will need to know a bit more in detail. If you could now pause this video at this point and draw out this 2D model of the brachial plexus before we progress on to the next slide. So let's take a step back and go back to our starting point, which are the roots, okay? They are formed from the anterior rami of the C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1 spinal nerves. They leave the spinal cord through their respective intervertebral foramina, okay? And in the cervical spine, remember that the spinal nerve leaves above its corresponding level so that the C5 spinal nerve would leave at the C4, C5 level. In the neck, these roots lie between the medial and anterior scalene muscles. At this level, there are two branches. The C5 spinal nerve, there's a dorsal scapular nerve branch, okay, and this goes to supply the rhomboid, the rhomboid major and rhomboid minor. The other branch comes from the C5, C6, C7 spinal nerves, forming the long thoracic nerve, and this muscle goes to supply serratus anterior, and these are pure motor nerves. The roots of the brachial plexus transition into the trunks at the base of the neck. These then transverse laterally ac across the posterior triangle of the neck before entering the upper limb. There are three trunks in total and these are called the upper, the middle and the lower, which corresponds to their respective position to each other. The upper trunk is formed from the C5 and C6 roots. The middle trunk is a direct continuation of the C7 root, and the lower trunk is formed from the C8 and T1 root. Remember, the names of the trunks are in relation to their position to each other. The branches at this level come solely from the upper trunk, and these are the suprascapular nerve, which supplies the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle, and the nerve to subclavius, which as its name provides motor innovation to the subclavius muscle. The next part of the brachial plexus is known as the divisions. The important things to know at this level are that the divisions are formed as the brachial plexus leaves the posterior triangle of the neck to pass into the axilla over the first rib. There are six divisions in total, three anterior and three posterior. Anterior and posterior to what? There is no specific structure they're related to, it's just the course they run in. Each trunk divides into an anterior and posterior division, and there are no branches at this level. The next part, and probably the most important part of the brachial plexus, are known as the cords. They are formed in the axilla, and the names of the cords are based on the relation to the axillary artery. There are three cords in total, the lateral, which is formed from the anterior division of the superior trunk and the anterior division of the middle trunk, 
and this is located lateral to the axillary artery. The posterior cord, which is drawn from the posterior divisions of the superior, middle and inferior trunk. And this lies posterior to the axillary artery. And the medial cord, which is formed from the anterior division of the inferior trunk. And this lies medial to the axillary artery in the axilla. Again, the name of the cords correspond to the relation of the axillary artery which it travels with. At the cords, there are a few nerves which branch out at this level, and these are important to know. From the lateral cord, there is one nerve, which is called the lateral pectoral nerve. From the posterior cord, there are three nerves which branch out, and these are the thoracodorsal, the lower subscapular nerve, and the upper subscapular nerve. And from the medial cord, there are three nerves also, and these are the medial pectoral nerve, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and we shall go into these in a bit more detail. We'll now talk a bit more about the functions of these branches. Most of them are pure motor nerves at this level with exception for two nerves which have the word cutaneous in their name. From the lateral cord we have the lateral pectoral nerve which innervates pectoralis major. From the posterior cord we have three nerve branches thoracodorsal nerve which innervates latissimus dorsi, the lower subscapular nerve which innervates subscapular anterus major, and the upper subscapular nerve which innervates subscapular muscle. And from the medial cord we again have three nerve branches, the medial pectoral nerve which is a pure motor nerve supplying pectoralis major and pectoralis minor, and then we have two cutaneous nerves, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm supplying the sensation over the medial aspect of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm which supplies sensory innervation to the medial aspect of the forearm. The two things I'd like to highlight are the medial pectoral nerve and lateral pectoral nerve which people can get confused as to which one innervates pectoralis minor. The way I remember it is that the medial pectoral nerve begins with an M innervates both major and minor. The other nerve which people often get confused is which subscapular nerve innervates teres major. Um, and you just have to remember that it's the lower one which innervates both subscapular and teres major. And now finally we've reached the end of our brachial plexus which ends as five terminal branches. The muscular cutaneous nerve, the axillary nerve, the median nerve, the radial nerve and the ulnar nerve. And so we finally have our completed map of the brachial plexus and its branches in this 2D model. And hopefully now, by using that structured approach to learning the brachial plexus, you will be able to understand its course and better interpret more detailed pictures like this. But that's not the end of this teaching. And unfortunately, we need to know a bit more detail about those five terminal branches. Today, we shall be discussing the muscular cutaneous and axillary nerves. So, what do we need to know about the axillary nerve? Again, when describing or understanding any nerve, we need to use a structured systematic approach. The axillary nerve gets its nerve fibers from the C5, C6 spinal level. It branches from the posterior cord in the axilla and then leaves the axilla by passing posterior through the quadrangular space along with the posterior humeral circumflex vessels. The nerve then travels medially winding around the posterior aspect of the surgical neck of the humerus before giving off its three terminal branches. The axillary nerve has both motor and sensory functions. It supplies the deltoid and teres minor muscles. Deltoid is responsible for shoulder abduction from 15 to 90 degrees range of movement. And teres minor is one of the external rotators of the shoulder. It also supplies sensation to the upper aspect of the lateral arm, also known as the regimental badge area. For any nerve injury, you need to know the mechanism that causes it and the resulting deficit. Common mechanisms for axillary nerve injuries are shoulder dislocation, humeral neck fractures, sharp trauma to the neck or axillary region, and iatrogenic causes such as surgery. 
The deficit that results in an axillary nerve injury is its motor deficit, in which you have loss of abduction from 15 to 90 degrees, and weak external rotation. The sensory deficit that you get is you get absent or reduced sensation over the regimental badge area. The muscular cutaneous nerve. So again, using a systematic structured approach, it's, it gets its innervation from the C5, C6, C7 nerve roots. It's a branch from the lateral cord in the axilla and emerges at the inferior border of pectoralis minor. It leaves the axilla by piercing the coracobrachialis muscle near its insertion on the humerus. It travels down the flexor compartment of the upper arm, superficial to brachialis, and then pierces the deep fascia lateral on the biceps brachii to emerge lateral to the biceps tendon. It then continues down the lateral aspect of the forearm as the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The muscular cutaneous nerve has both motor and sensory function. Its motor function comes from innervation of the coracobrachialis, brachialis, and biceps brachii muscle. It is also worth noting that the brachialis muscle receives a small contribution from the radial nerve. Coracobrachialis is responsible for forward flexion of the arm and the shoulder joint. Brachialis is responsible for flexion of the forearm and the elbow joint. And biceps brachii is responsible for flexion of the forearm and the elbow joint. Powerful supination. And it also has a degree of flexion of the arm and the shoulder joint that comes from the long head of the biceps tendon. The muscular cutaneous nerve also provides cutaneous sensation over the lateral aspect of the forearm. Common mechanisms for muscular cutaneous nerve injuries include iatrogenic causes, repetitive or forceful upper extremity movements, and shock trauma. The deficit that one would experience with a muscular cutaneous nerve injury would be motor weakness of shoulder flexion, elbow flexion, and, and forearm supination, and absent or reduced sensation over the lateral aspect of the forearm. It is very important to note that Whilst the muscular, muscular cutaneous nerve provides innervation to biceps and brachialis, elbow flexion and supination, as well as shoulder flexion, are still possible, however weak, due to other muscles which also are responsible for these movements. Such muscles include deltoid and pectoralis major for forward flexion of the shoulder, brachioradialis for elbow flexion, and supinator for supination. We will finish off our teaching by talking about some common brachial plexus injuries. The first one which you would have heard of previously is Erbischen palsy. This is an injury to the upper roots, C5 and C6. It occurs due to lateral flexion of the neck away from the ipsilateral shoulder. And examples of these would be shoulder dystocia and motorcycle accidents. An injury of the upper roots of the brachial plexus will cause the arm to lie limply by the side, internally rotated, with the forearm extended and pronated with a weighted step at the wrist. The deficits that one would expect in such an upper root uh, brachial plexus injury would be loss of shoulder abduction and external rotation, and elbow flexion and supination. There will also be loss of dermatomal C5 and C6 distributions. The other brachial plexus injury you need to be aware of is Klumke's palsy, which is an injury to the lower roots of the brachial plexus, C8 and T1. The mechanism of injury usually involves forceful upward traction or hyperabduction of the arm at the shoulder. The deficits that one would expect would be loss of intrinsic muscles of the hand and dermatomal sensory loss at C8 and T1 distributions. In this policy, patients usually get clawing of the hand, and this is caused by unopposed action 
of intact forearm flexors and extensors, causing flexion at the interphalangeal joints and extension at the metacarpal phalangeal joints. Usually, this is prevented from happening by action of the lumbricals, which allow for flexion at the metacarpal phalangeal joints while keeping the interphalangeal joints extended. A lower brachial plexus root injury will cause loss of the lumbricals and therefore clawing at the hand as described previously. So the take home points from this teaching would be practice drawing the brachial plexus out, remember the sequence of transitions, roots, trunks, divisions, cords and terminal branches and you can remember this using the mnemonic revised dam cadaveric book and revise all individual nerve functions. Thank you. This is the end of the teaching.